since there are significant numbers of people who have not uh, encountered some machine learning, I will go through very slowly with this material. So I've, I have shared these slides. So if you are not um, if you are not uh, following along, uh, you could grab the slides later. And I do this transcripting because I have an accent, and of course, uh, you know, not everyone's really good with English, so we have that as well. So um, hopefully, hopefully, everything is in place for people to do well. So off the bat, let me just state what we are here to do. Uh, for, with this talk, I just want to make sure that you are aware broadly of what types of machine learning problems are being solved in astronomy. Uh, and I'm not going to, when I'm doing this, go through specifics of how it was done, but it's sort of just to get an overview of like what people are doing with machine learning in astronomy. And uh, I want all of you who are potentially going to be in some way or the other using machine learning in research, uh, understand that it's not a static situation where you, you know, learn a bunch of stuff. Uh, and those are the only things that you can ha you can happily carry with yourself moving forward. So if you really want to be somebody who's using machine learning innovatively and using looking at data innovatively, you have to at the same time keep up to date with the with research in machine learning and seeing whether some of those techniques would actually be a breakthrough in, in your astronomy question. Uh, but while you do this, we also don't want to get lost. We don't want to be you know, continuously looking at neurops. We don't want to be looking at ICML all the time. We also want to keep at the same time uh, our eyes on the science question that we want to do. So that balancing act is tough. But it's uh, it's something that can give you significant rewards. It's an up and coming sort of like intersection uh, that people are very interested in. So it's it's a situation where you can actually do well uh, in your career as well. So uh, you know you may even not want to do astronomy, and you still those intersections will be useful no matter where you go in your life. Um, so this is a sort of a version of the talk that I gave last year, but it's significantly distilled down. It's sort of also uh, such that it's more relevant for MMA. The link to the YouTube for the previous lesson is also there, so you can hear me say the same stuff in a different way with more examples. So just that's another good uh, place to look at. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this situation, uh, so um, let me think about it this way. Uh, Okay, I should have probably moved this slide over later. Uh, but then, like I mentioned, uh, in, in some of the discussions that we're going to do, I'm not going to go into the details of how they were implemented, because those things are slowly absorbed, and you will have to go through it um, like uh, in detail, and we don't have the time for that. Uh, but this slide is just to say that there are many techniques, and uh, some of them are easier, some of them are more involved. And hopefully you should be uh, able to use many of these techniques. So you can actually choose which method would be useful for your question when you are getting to that situation. Uh, and these are very easy to implement because of so many tools that are out there where essentially you can treat them as black boxes where you're not interested in the particular methodology. That is also an option. Um, but we're not going to go into any of these. And hopefully in the summer school, when you're working through examples, you will be introducing yourself to some of them. Um, uh, so first thing, uh, first things first, uh, hold on one second, something's really, okay. Uh, geez, why did I do it this way? Um, okay. Sorry, I I, I missed uh, like right before the end, uh, start of the uh, talk. I just sort of like rearranged the slides, and I had I had a better thing in mind. I I think I didn't do a good job. Anyway, point. Uh, so in this in this talk, what we, uh, like I mentioned, we're going through specific examples of how data science was used to attack some science questions, and the the list here: classification, regression, clustering, generative modeling. All of those are sort of examples we will look at in more detail. Uh, all of these specific tasks come under the larger umbrella of some of these other techniques that are usually also packaged for you. So you can think about statistical inference, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning under the umbrella of which you can actually solve these tasks. Uh, but in this talk, I'm going to focus on the specific types of tasks and sort of see examples of how they were applied in, in astronomy. Uh, so before we move forward, I want to make sure we're all uh 
uh, uh, all agree on the terminology that I'll be using. Uh, the first terminology is examples. Examples are individual instances of data. So one, one, one particular type of data is an example. Each example can then also be associated with things called features uh, that are describing the data. And I will give examples of how this look like in a second, but we want to make sure that we are, we're all, we all agree on what this looks like. Uh, for the set of examples that you have that are described by these features, you also have associated targets or responses uh, that you would be considering. And this is usually in a supervised learning case where you actually have associated values. Uh, and this would be the actual target. This is what you want to predict for data that you have not seen before. Uh, so in uh, and training data is called X, uh, and uh, uh, you can break up your training data into a set called validation data that's also a subset of X. And there is uh, the testing data, which is known as the testing data, which is the one that is associated. Um, geez, I, I actually made a mistake here again. Let me just fix it right away. Um, so this is also X. Um, and this is this is not true. Okay. Uh, so the way so the the example that I can give you of this is as follows: the say you have an example in a population like one individual, and she is described by a certain set of properties. So this individual is a female uh, who's age twenty six, has a height of five feet and three inches. Uh, she has a major that was physics, and her current income is eighty one thousand. So this individual is an example of your data. And the particular values that you have that describe this individual are the features of this individual. And the associated value that you would probably be interested in predicting. So say, for example, this is her life expectancy and whether or not she's a homeowner or whether she's a renter. So uh, the individual uh, that you're considering can be described by things that you're probably predicting. So you will fill up this vector with many examples of many individuals that you'll collect similar data for. And you want to be, uh, you want to be able to develop a model that can generalize. So once you start looking beyond the data that you have collected, you want to be able to make sure that for given this set of information for an unknown, uh, un for unseen individual in the past, you should also be able to tell me what their life expectancy is, whether you expect them to be a home homeowner or a renter. Um, and this is this is sort of the descriptive sort of mathematical situation you usually uh, will be dealing with. Um, and this is this is sort of like the framework you want to put your uh, your data set before you actually apply a data science model on top of it. Um, so the once you have this prepared, you can solve many types of problems. As I said, we will consider various types of tasks. So in the previous example, remember that we looked at various types of information. So for example, here, uh whether what her major was is a label uh which means that you can you have a specific set to choose from she could be a major in in sociology she could be a major in in mathematics and those are specific sort of uh uh, uh, value, uh specific individual uh labels that could be associated with her but you could also have a real number which is a continuous function uh that could be descriptive so like uh the age uh or the uh or the or the income could also be things that are more continuous in fashion. Similarly, the the specific uh, target values can also be uh, can also be specific labels, or they could be values. So, for example, the renter information. If you have a binary situation where you could either be a renter or a homeowner, uh, that would be a situation where you have labels um, and uh, instead of values, where you probably are looking at something like uh, uh, the life expectancy. So in a classification problem, we have the situation as follows, that we are, we are given a bunch of data set, uh, a data like the one that we were seeing, that's X. Um, and for that data set X, we want to predict uh, a value, oh, sorry, in this, sorry, a label Y. So usually when people introduce this, they will think about classifying images of cats and dogs. And cats can have certain characteristics. So say you have one example of a cat and you have some features describing that cat. 
And that cat could have a measurement for how long the length of her snout was, how pointy her ears were. And given those two features, you will have a label calling her a cat or a dog. And similarly, uh, you would have the same situation for a dog and you will have many sort of, you look at a poodle, you look at a golden retriever or whatever, you make that whole list. And then you have that data set that then maps on to whether uh, each example was a cat or a dog. This is a supervised learning setting, which means that you have some target values that you wish to, uh, that you wish to predict over. And in the classification setting, those target values are labels and individual individual uh, individual values from a set that you wish to choose from. By far, in astronomy um, and in most other settings, this would be the most common type of task. You want to just put things in buckets. You want to say, is it A? Is it B? Uh, so the an example from astronomy that I will go through would be just to think about a binary classification problem. And this is a very important problem that you would want to solve. So say, for example, you have a telescope and you take an image of the portion of the sky. And in that region, you could have stars or galaxies that are present. Uh, and you want to be able to say autonomously, you don't want to look at it manually because you probably are collecting a lot of information, whether the particular object was a star or a galaxy. So this particular paper uh, is solving that problem. And uh, so they have multiple models here. So for example, RF means random forest. Uh, and they are trying to see whether uh, they are able to tell you if that object was a star or a galaxy. And this is essentially uh, a plot of true positive and false positive, which means that is the classifier uh, able to pick up most of my real stars or real galaxies, but how many contaminants are getting introduced at the same time. This is a common type of plot, and I think it takes a little bit of um, um, uh, sort of like dedicated study to understand what it actually shows. I'm not going to go into in detail, but uh, you will look at some of these plots more often where you're actually doing the trade off of where do you want to set your decision threshold, whether you want an aggressive classifier, which is actually picking up a lot of what is interesting to you, but at the same time, it's contaminated with a lot of information. Uh, and you know where exactly that threshold is, and you do this in drug development also. It's a very um, interest. It's a very important metric that you may want to look at. The second type of task is a regression task, where instead of now having labels, you actually have real numbers that you want to predict over. So this is a continuous function. So again, given your features x, uh, you may want to predict what exactly your value we, uh, might be. So in our previous example, we actually took looked at demographic information for a particular person. And if you were looking at income information, that would be a continuous number that you may want to predict. Uh, this is, again, a supervised learning problem because you actually have the associated values that you're going to fit over so that when you look at new data, you should be able to tell what that is. Um, the most straightforward type of regression task you could do is known as linear regression, which is literally just fitting a straight line. And I, I remember encountering linear regression back in high school when we were trying to sort of look at how wax, just, you know, wax that was melted was uh, uh, solid, uh, solidified. So we actually had a thermometer and we actually had a, a coefficient of something that we were looking at for, for the wax and how it was, uh, 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 where, where the melting point was. So we actually took the temperature data as a function of time, and then we, we figured out what the melting was. And you, you basically fit a straight line to that, and that's linear regression for you. Uh, so uh, this one, the, the plot here is actually showing you fitting a straight line through that. Um, if you were able to take your value y, and then you can uh, sort of say anything below or above that is, um, is a certain class. Say, for example, we're looking at income information, uh, and we put a threshold of $80,000, and we call anything uh, earning above $80,000 as uh, you know someone who is uh, well off and someone who probably is struggling um, is someone who is earning below that. That will be turning your regression problem into a classification problem, and you can do this as well. A very uh, important type of regression problem that people usually want to solve is looking, uh, estimating photometric redshifts. So in astronomy, what you do is that you usually will take uh, observations of the same object in various filters. 
So in your telescope, you can, you know, attach your uh, attach various filters and you can look at the same object and the the intensity or how bright the object appears in every single filter will be different because the spectral energy distribution will be peaked in different portions. So maybe in, in sort of like a more generalized setting, you can imagine a very hot object that emits a lot in the UV, but not as much in the infrared. And uh, so when you take a picture in the UV or the infrared, you actually see the object be more bright in one or the other, but you can actually do this in, in some sort of like more, more, more uh, in just the uh, visible wavelengths as well. So you create these buckets and you say, how much am I getting in bucket this, bucket that? So if you have a if you have a telescope with filters U G R I Z, which are all all optical filters, and you say how bright is it? Was it was it in U? Was it in G? And you actually want to use that as a function or as as a metric of how far that object was. So imagine two similar objects that you have uh, with a, with a similar amount of energy profile. If you place that object further from you. Um, you will actually see that it's more redshifted because uh, because the, there is uh, uh, the, the redshift in the sense that you know with with uh, with the universe expanding that same energy profile will be redshifted so you actually see the object that was further away be brighter in the redder filters so you can actually learn this mapping where you have the uh, the the emission from the same source in different filters to have an estimate of redshift. So these papers were actually doing this, pro solving this problem, and they use neural networks uh, to actually do this, where they take the mappings of uh, various uh, uh, the intensity in various filters and tell you how far that, uh, how uh, what the redshift or how far away that object was. Uh, you can uh, do clustering on the same data. So say for example, you have uh, features that are describing uh, uh, you have the uh, you have your training data uh, that are described by feature sex, and you want to ask whether there are meaningful groups present in that data set. Uh, so, say for example, you were given um, data from users using Spotify, and you you had sort of like what well, a set of songs that they listen to or artists that they subscribe to. Could you tell me if there are groups of interest that are present? So, for example, people interested in hip hop or people interested uh, in classical. Could you make these groups? And that would be a clustering problem where you look at related related subgroups within your uh, within your uh, within your training data. Uh, this type of uh, this type of problem is an unsupervised problem because we really don't care about the target values. We are literally just taking your training data and trying to see if there are groups present inside them. So this would be probably a visualization in a two dimensional plane uh, where you slice up the set and you actually want to see uh, where the groups are. And the, the reason why you may want to do this regardless of uh, uh, whether or not this would be your science objective would be because it's important in exploratory data analysis. So when somebody presents you a bunch of data, you usually want to massage it and you want to sort of see uh, through uh, and you know identify you know what exactly are you looking at. And one of the things that you may want to do is actually figure out uh, whether there is any class imbalance. So if people were giving you the star galaxy uh, classification problem that we were talking about earlier, you will actually find that there are orders of magnitude more stars than galaxies. And you want to do this inference. You want to sort of see uh, how many of how many stars examples were you given, how many galaxy examples were you given, and how they are distributed. So this would be an important thing you want to try uh, even if this wasn't your uh, your eventual goal to apply your data science problem. And often when people are trying to solve uh, this clustering problem, they may not just want to work with your data set X, they may want to actually use dimensionality reduction techniques, which sort of takes combinations. So you could actually have some, some representation of your input vector X that encodes information that looks at correlations. Uh, that is a dimensionality reduction uh, technique. PCA is an example. There are many, many more. Uh, and the reason people want to do this sometimes is because sometimes the, uh, the, uh, the clusters that are present are more evident in this, uh, in this reduced space uh, than, than in the raw feature space that you would be presented with. Um, and uh, once you actually find your cluster, say, for example, you apply your unsupervised clustering technique, you can take the labels that you get 
and then you can turn this to be, be a classification problem uh, or for example in this case you may have this this particular event out all the way out here um uh, and i'm calling it event it's an example of a data it could be one instance that is completely you know out there and uh, this could just not be faulty data it could be actually some interesting new phenomenon so if you're interested in discovery and a lot of people are uh, you may want to use clustering techniques to isolate something that is interesting and out there so the way you could use clustering in in astronomy uh, would be to actually look at large scale properties of large amounts of events. So say, for example, you're interested in trying to uh, look at galaxies and put them in various buckets. You may want to uh, a, a morphological bucket. So in terms of shape, uh, you may want to do this using what people have come up with based on smaller amounts of data. So before they had collected a lot of data, they decided buckets A through D. Uh, or you may want to do it in a data driven way. So this particular paper was looking at properties of stars of sorry properties of galaxies. So this was the total mass of the galaxy, you could have things like its radius its star formation rate, and they came up with clusters, uh, they came up with groups in this feature space. And then they connected it with traditionally used uh, morphological classifications that were more historic in nature. So say, for example, you have an elliptical galaxy, uh, they looked at uh, they looked at the properties of these galaxies and they came up with their own clusters that you're seeing here. And they're saying that, say, for example, this this empirically derived cluster type A, RA5 is connected to an empirical type, which maps on to its properties. So that would be a type of inference, uh, inference that you may want to do, just put things in buckets and see how they kind of look like. Um, you may uh, want to do uh, generative modeling. Uh, so say, for example, you uh, you have your training data set and for some reason you feel you don't have a large enough training data set. You want to create more. Uh, so how would you how would you take your data set X and create more data y, uh, X prime out of it? So a very prominent example, if, you, if we've been following sort of any machine learning development would be to uh, look at how algorithms that are synthesizing very feasible human faces. So for this, this is just a collection of human faces that are no real humans on planet Earth. So what they have done is they have been able to come up with what the underlying distribution of the data is and sample from it to create very convincing new data that is synthetic that you that doesn't exist. Um, this is an unsupervised learning task again, because you're not interested in what the target values are. Uh, you just want to you just want to synthesize. You want to get an estimate of the underlying density, so you can you can actually uh, you can come up with new data. But then maybe the density estimation is your goal. So you you eventually want uh, you want may want to use generative modeling to come up come at what the underlying density distribution is. And another way that this is actually used is to build generate uh, generative adversarial networks where you have a generator which keeps generating and these spaces are an example of how this was done uh, where you have a generator that generates artificial data and a discriminator uh sort of the person who's like, like the inspector looking at your data that can tell you whether the generated stuff is real or fake so you can actually combine that situation uh to to end up uh, with a very powerful generator which can fool fool the inspector that can tell you whether or not the data was real or not. And this was applied in astronomy to uh, to not only, uh, so you know, genera uh, generating synthetic galaxies could have its own goal. So you could probably want to see sort of what the distribution of like galaxies are, because we only see whatever the universe allows us to see. Maybe you want to just see whatever is possible or what your physics predicts uh, in terms of what galaxies should be out there. Uh, but this paper went one step further. They actually uh, were able to uh, generate a uh, again a generative adversarial neural network that was not only able to synthesize galaxies, but you know obviously remember you can tell whether the galaxy is fake or not. Uh, they were able in this network they were able to inject real galaxies, and the discriminator was actually able to identify stuff that was not real. But what this corresponded to was anomalies, like things that were actually interesting galaxies that are not 
sort of what you expect from uh, from the general distribution of galaxies that you see. So the ones that you see here are actually the real ones that is the, the discriminator was saying is a fake one or a, or a bad one. Uh, but these are actually discoveries. So this was a, a nice, interesting application that people that people applied. Um, another type of uh, thing you could do is uh, called transfer learning. Um, and this is something that you might want to do where if you are, you know, limited in some way in, in, in uh, how you will apply your data science technique. So say, for example, somebody gives you a pre-trained, just it's, it's already, you know, doing something uh, for domain D. Uh, your goal is to take that pre-existing model and apply it to your problem that is slightly, slightly related to the problem it was trained on. So if we go back to our very first example of discriminating between cats and dogs, if someone gave you a classifier that could do this discrimination and you wanted to do something for uh, wildlife demographics, could you take that classifier and then make it discriminate between tigers and wolves in, uh, because this is a related domain. And depending on uh, the model that you were provided to by this other person, this could be a supervised or unsupervised learning task uh, because uh, you know the the source domain could be solving the particular problem that you would be interested in. But the the transfer itself uh, consists of some uh, some additional things that you may have to keep in mind to make sure that it actually works in the new domain where you take your model to. Um, this particular type this this type of approach is essentially a form of knowledge transfer. And the reason, as I mentioned, you may want to do this is because you may want to save either time or resources. So time because may, it's it's really expensive uh, and exhaustive to actually develop your own uh, your own data science models. Um, you may not have the computing resources to do this. You may not have the time to do it. Uh, or, for example, another type of resource limitation would be that you start off, you just have a small amount of data to to work from so in in wildlife you may not have enough examples of like you know diverse examples of wolves and and tigers to actually train something from scratch so every time you uh, you if you want to piggyback of something that somebody else did you may want to use transfer learning so that's where uh, that would be useful this has been applied uh, quite uh, quite often uh, and i like this paper in particular because it actually showed that uh, you may want to be very careful to transfer learning approaches, regardless of whether you were resource limited. So in this case, what happened was uh, these people were interested in finding merging galaxies, and uh, they had uh, they had a large amount of training data that was simulated, and they eventually want to find merging galaxies in real data. Um, and because the training data is much larger, uh, which is the simulated data, that was a good place to start training this classifier on. But when they actually took it to the uh, to to the actual domain of interest, it didn't do as well. So these are various metrics. So, like for example, accuracy, how accurate you were, and various other metrics that you would be interested usually in evaluating. And uh, the say, for example. So the the uh, the fiducial one where they actually don't uh, they don't pay attention to how the two domains relate to each other uh, is the blue one. So the source domain, the simulated stuff, had an accuracy that you were seeing is pretty high, and you would actually get that. Like if you have a good classifier, uh, you would actually get good accuracies on them. Uh, but when they took it to the real domain where you had real merging galaxies, that dropped. And what they did was they they did a very specific and careful uh, uh, implementation of trying to force the GAN in this case to focus on domain invariant features. And while they suffered, so this one, this yellow thing is what the, the transfer learning portion is. They did suffer some loss in the source domain. So they actually didn't do as well as they would uh, in the simulated data, but when they actually transferred it to real data, which is the solid barrier, the accuracy was better. So this is just uh, this is just an extreme interesting uh, uh, sort of like a paper that reminds us that even if we sort of take our training data, when we take it to the real world, we may actually not do as well as we were hoping because there is enough uh, dissimilarities between the two domains.
Uh, and the, the last type of approach that I will discuss is active and reinforcement learning, where again, you have some sort of a limitation. So for example, your data set is small and uh, you, you may want to add to it, but uh, you want to add to it only when you feel that it would be important for your learning task. So uh, say, for example, uh, you want to uh, select a bunch of protein structures for doing drug development, uh, but drug development is expensive. You have to go through all these trials and phases. How can you select a subset of proteins that are more likely to succeed in subsequent, tri uh, subsequent trials? That would be an example of uh, uh, that would be an example of, of uh, 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 active learning where you actually select carefully for which ones would be the most useful. Um, and the way this works is essentially you, you start with uh, a very large data set and you train your learning model on top of it. Then you apply it to your very, so you apply it to your very large candidate set. So remember the things that you have information for is very little and you want to apply it to a large set and you want to augment uh, your label, your very small label data set with stuff that would actually be useful to improve your learning model. So with this unlabeled data set, uh, you, will have, uh, you will have selection procedures to identify which examples would be best to get information on. So that will be queried to an Oracle uh, this could just be like people providing labels, experts providing labels, or it could be an environment responding. Um, uh, like, you know, in, in case of self-driving cars, you can actually have information from the environment uh, that then is fed back and improves your, uh, your label data set in, in a very specific way. So it's not just adding randomly, it's adding specifically to improve your learning model. Um, and classically, uh, this is sort of the field of optimal design of experiments as to how to select your experiments so that you do really well on your objective. And in the in the uh, and just just a sub note that if you don't have an Oracle present, this is a semi supervised learning learning task. Uh, so the way this was applied in, in research was actually for citizen science. So what have uh, so there is a very uh, amazing resource called Zooniverse where citizen scientists, anybody, uh, can go in and help with, with a task uh, that would, you know, that requires a lot of labor. Um, and here for, in this case, this is an example of actually classifying galaxies again. So uh, the human, if you go there and you sign up, they will give you a picture and they'll ask you to give it a label. And the thing is that you, you, we have tons of pictures of galaxies and we eventually can use a machine learning model on top of it so if we have humans, human betters with, with our amazing visual recognition systems who can come in and help out, can we give them very specific examples to label so that eventually that can just help and assist with our classifier that, you know, can do things at much larger scales. So in this case, they actually developed it. So this was an example that were presented to the user because it would be helpful to help a classifier that already could do bar galaxy recognition, except that this case would be the one that would be most helpful to improve the classifier. So that, that's what um, was done. Uh, with that being said, I want to also highlight some uh, interesting applications without sort of focusing, uh, with sort of with, uh, with sort of benefits from some of the discussion that we've been having so far, which is uh, the first one of which is to actually identify anomalies. So the whole goal and everybody loves discovering new things. Uh, so for example, this, this, uh, this particular paper looked at ZTF uh, data release and was able to find an interesting unclassified variable, variable object that could be interesting. And they actually did follow up on it, as you can see here. So this is the variable star. They did follow up on it um, to see whether or not this was actually a new and interesting type of phenomenon. Um, another example that you will hear often if you go to conferences now is physics informed networks. So in uh, when when you are at the stage, you're looking at neural networks more carefully, you will realize that they are just function approximators. And uh, you may want to introduce your knowledge of physics somewhere in the process. So you could you could in invoke limitations that you know uh, apply to the physical system that you're studying, so you do a better job. So in this case, we had a there was a generator that synthesized artificial light curves for RR Lyrae stars. 
And what these authors did was that they were able to introduce a layer in which you could in, uh, input input physical properties like effective temperature and radius and you could in you could generate very in a controlled fashion what the light curves would be for those properties so that would be an interesting app that is an interesting application people talk about now there's an application of deep blending so say for example you have some overlapping galaxies uh can you eventually have this be processed through so you can actually separate the two uh, that uh, this this app this sort of process has applications for cosmology via lensing, uh, lensing signatures that you may be interested in that would differ between the two galaxies. Um, and the final one that I will mention is resource allocation. So uh, this is this is extremely important now because when you have a lot of data, uh, you may want to follow up on things that are interesting to you. Uh, from that large data, but it's hard to make a decision on this explore exploit situation where you have a large amount of options to choose from, but you don't know which one would be the most useful for you, uh, 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 given the limited resources that you have. So, for example, if you have if you could obtain spectra to get classifications, which is an expensive thing to do because spectra getting spectra takes time uh can you do better than selecting randomly so in this case uh the, these authors did what was that they start with an uh, they start with some small data set and they start choosing very carefully uh which events would be most useful to get spectron to improve your classifier so in this case they had a uh, 1a non 1a classifier and uh, they had a random strategy which means they selected randomly and they had better strategies as well, which are sort of these, these lines over here. And what they found is that if they use some of these um, some of these better strategies in the long run, so for example, here they're looking at figure of metric, your random strategy over long uh, over a longer uh, sort of like set of cycles by which you're obtaining spectra, uh, will actually uh, perform using something that is more informed in terms of like knowing what the classifier will benefit from. And uh, uh, this over here is another example where you could actually choose which galaxies to get spectra for so that you better best constrain your cosmology because spectra gives you information on distances and you just don't want to always pick the brightest stuff uh, because they would be easy to get spectra for. You may want to select some things that are fainter, but which ones exactly, right? Because there's so many to choose from, but can you choose, pick and choose exactly which ones would be most useful for your cosmology. So that would be, that's another example of a resource allocation problem. And uh, before we move on to the rest of the material, uh, I just want to make sure that no matter what, when you are done with development, you always keep in mind some of these other considerations which are completely data driven. In fact, this is a checklist that I would use myself uh, to make sure that, you know, for example, you you're careful with features feature selection right so if you have a bunch of features that we were discussing previously age uh, age height uh, so maybe height correlates with life expectancy but not so much the major that the person chooses so you may want to actually focus on descriptive of your of your prediction uh, of your prediction task uh, and not have it be confused by some of the other features that are not relevant for your task in mind so this is actually a very this is some place where your artistry comes becomes very important uh, but it is nonetheless an important thing to consider uh, so this one here is just an example for for this class imbalance issue that i was mentioning before that you have several orders of magnitude more stars than galaxies and if you just start with the training data set that holds this imbalance when you do your training you will actually uh, you will actually train better on the on the stars than on the galaxies so uh, you may want to actually come up with methods to uh, address this class imbalance so that eventually when you deploy your algorithm you do better for everything uh, in general. So this is just a bunch of stuff I will not go through in detail. I think it's just useful to have as a checklist when you know you make sure you okay, I did this, I did this, I did this. Um, uh, for the rest of the talk, I was going to go through some ways of applying machine learning for multi-messenger astronomy. There's a bunch of other stuff that I have, and I see it's already 45 minutes. Can Michael advise me if uh, if uh, how much time uh, is it okay to actually still spend or would he prefer that I, I take questions at this point?
No, I think in general, we have a lot of flexibility here, right? Okay. Um, yeah. Immediately. So yeah, so just yeah, do your thing and we can we can make the schedule work. Right. So let, let me just pause here and ask if people have questions. So I'm just going to go through these slides in case it reminds people of something, but if they have questions, I'm happy to answer them. I want to look at chat in case somebody asked a question. Uh, oh, somebody other says, say, for example, we generate a synthetic data set of galaxies that lie pretty far from us. Then, so then will we be able to get some new information about the properties of these galaxies? And is it any different from analyzing these set of galaxies using a simulation? Uh, uh, others, are you, are you able to speak? Uh, could you, if, if you're able to, could you tell me what information, um, uh, so you, you're talking about synthesizing galaxies at redshifts uh, that are, that, uh, for example, they're faint and we want to, oh, um, so then what do we mean? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about that, so I'm not entirely sure. Let me let me muse a little bit about this problem. So the the entire point is, if you're able to generate some faint galaxies, right? Uh, they still uh, and you will be generating them from a training data set that has uh, some information uh, that has um, fewer of those faint galaxies. But the generation process takes uh, you know thinks about the underlying distribution and sort of maybe extrapolates to fainter galaxies. So you would be you would probably synthesize some galaxies where you have done some extrapolation from where you actually had a better estimation so you should be able to but it would be a function of the the data that you actually were pro, uh, were uh, were generating from if you were doing resource allocation which means say for example you want to have you have a, uh, a redshift model you have a redshift model and you want to be able to fit it and you want to make sure you specifically query some of the faint galaxies so you can constrain it better that's a resource allocation setting so um you can eventually be very focused on 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 that choice so that that way th then you can turn it around and be like okay i'm sampling this very carefully so i i know what my redshift model is very well over there um and then and this is there any different from analyzing these sets of galaxies using so again uh, with a simulation i think you're always with a simulation if you have uh, if you have a situation where your uh, your training data set was deriving from a situ so this this sort of this question sort of touches on many different things i think it's a it's a probably a better discussion to have in person because it'll benefit others i think more than other people but i'm happy to talk about it. so others please email me if you want to set a time to talk about it and i can uh, be very careful. Uh, I want to travel. Are you uh, from the room? Is that okay? Sorry? We have a question from the room. Can we ask? Yes. Can... Yes. Uh, probably I missed it, but uh, what exactly the difference between the unsupervised and the reinforcement level? You... Maybe you got that. Did you already get that? Yes. So she's asking about the difference between unsupervised and reinforcement learning. Um, so in an unsupervised, uh, so there's, um, there's, uh, so in an unsupervised, so when we, so in, in the canonical unsupervised learning setting, you do not have labels. So you're just looking at features of the training data set. Um, in, uh, in the reinforcement learning setting, you have, you have also the ability to do exploration and you can have delayed consequences. What this, what this means, so I, I think it's best to think about sort of playing a game. Uh, say, for example, you have a bunch of chess examples that you have looked at, okay? Um, and you just look at that, you know, chess games, and if you are, uh, you're just sort of figuring out, you know, where, what clusters may exist for people who are elite players versus novice players, that is an unsupervised learning problem. And you, you may want to cluster them and see which games and which strategies did best. If you wanted to have an agent that artificially played the games where you eventually uh, wanted it to sort of explore new ways. So it, it, it not only uh, looks at what other people did, but it wanted to come up with its own solutions uh, where you're doing this exploration problem. 
uh, and also this question of delayed consequences, which means that you could do a bunch of uh, bunch of strategies on the board, but you don't know if they are good until you win the game or until you you have some uh, sort of like thing where you you took down a target. So that will be a reinforcement learning problem. It's much. It's a it's a very very different domain than. Uh, a supervised learning and an unsupervised learning situation. Um, imitation learning uh, is a situation where you will have delayed consequences, but you don't do the exploration. So imagine a situation where you wanted to imitate. So if you have a uh, have you have you have collected examples of people playing chess and you want to imitate some of the best players, uh, but you are not interested in sort of like exploring new solutions in the chess game, that would be imitation learning. So there are very, some of these like, you know, slices and very different approaches for doing that. Uh, usually, unless uh, uh, you want to do something very sophisticated, I would uh, not think that reinforcement learning would be something you want to get to. It's it's very difficult. It it involves its own um, set of like new techniques that you will have to think about. It's very very different uh, from uh, as statistical inference is different from neural networks. Neural networks are different different from reinforcement learning techniques. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ari. Any okay. From the room. I think you can keep going on your slides. I think what we'll we should cut off the session probably at 10 15. Okay. Uh, so that we can take a break and then we can start the next one at 10. Perfect. Okay. So somebody did ask, how does reinforcement learning take into account human bias? Is it likely through uh through human vetting? So in in the in the Zooniverse example, that was actually active learning. It wasn't reinforcement learning. So you know, you were try, you were picking things to label for. Uh, and the question is, does it take into account human bias? Uh, in in what what way human? Uh, so I I don't think so. So for so even uh, so, let me give you. I'm not exactly entirely sure how they did it in the paper, but let me tell you what they actually do when they give a uh, when they give a problem to a human. So in Zooniverse, when they're giving people things to label to, they're not just giving it to one person, they're giving it to several people. So usually if there is confusion, uh, if like, you know, one person, you know, for some reason chooses a particular answer, uh, it wouldn't have to matter so much because you actually pool from a larger number of people to actually choose which one the right thing is. The, the active learning situation where they pick the labels, it was only relevant to the classifier, which means that the it would be useful for the classifier. Now, when that goes to the human side, and if humans are introducing a bias, the selection of uh, uh, that example uh, and how it relates to that human bias, I don't know if they took it into account. I'm not very familiar with that paper. Um, so like, I'd encourage you to read that paper or probably reach out to the authors. I'm not sure again if it would be important to improve the classification performance in the end to you know debias the the human responses. Uh, probably something you want to do for research. <laughs> Sounds like a difficult thing to do to be honest. Like evaluating that portion. Um, uh, anyway, I will move forward now. I'm 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 really happy people are asking questions. So let me just let me just move ahead and talk about machine learning for multi messenger astronomy. Um, so, um, you know, this this entire summer school is uh, sort of motivated by science that is coming out of uh, uh, multi messenger astrophysics and potentially one of the bigger one of the bigger portions of that is LIGO and how LIGO uh, LIGO alerts are correlated with uh, with uh, with electromagnetic signatures that are uh, that, you know, probe the same thing. Uh, one of the most important ones are Kilonovi. Uh, so, you know, if you have a, a merger of two compact objects, uh, one of which at least contains a neutron star, you will have a, uh, you'll have several, you know, a wide array of processes that are occurring that, you know, uh, uh, that, that probe the disruption of this object, uh, maybe, um, if it disrupts actually, but then one of them would be that you actually have a kilonova, which is arising from our process nucleosynthesis in the, uh, from the ejecta. And these are very fast-lived transients. 
So uh, this is a collection of uh, light curves that were reported uh, and led by Igor, who uh, has spoken to you earlier, uh, that look uh, look at some of these uh, some of these counterparts. So they're not all they're not Kilanovi, uh, but they're all fast lived in that um, they uh, they they will uh, their emission will fade within a week. Uh, so they're actually kind of elusive. So people want to find them and they're very interesting because they're they're quite novel and they probe, you know, extreme physics that would otherwise be very hard to study. But by definition, they're actually quite short lived. Um, so let me walk you through what the what the big challenge is. OK, um, why why we want to use machine learning for multi messenger astronomy. So let's let's go through the scenario. Like, let's say LIGO is operating. LIGO is not operating now, but it's LIGO is operating. And somewhere in the universe, there was a merger of two neutron stars. And when they merged, uh, they sent out this gravitational wave that LIGO picked up. Along with, uh, like, say, for example, SWIFT, and it saw, saw the, uh, the high energy emission uh, from this merger. And, oops, sorry, skip to skip. Uh, and within minutes to an hour, uh, via various resources like GCN, uh, this alert is sent out to the community which includes information, for example, when the merger happened, you know, sort of where broadly in the sky it took place, and uh, maybe some information about the redshift. And then what surveys like ZTF will do is that in addition to their usual sort of schedule, they will actually go through and tile that sky localization region. So say, for example, this is your sky map. Um, sorry, th this is your sky, and uh, the, the blue regions are the sky maps where uh, the, uh, where LIGO thinks the event originated from, you may want to tile it to sort of get more information. And within a matter of minutes, uh, this is uh, delivered to our data operations uh, framework where some initial vetting is taking place. So, you know, we do a real bogus classifier. We sort of reject known sources. For example, you know, we reject AGN. And, uh, you know, uh, we reject things that are long lived because, you know, obviously this should be a new event. And uh, within a matter of, after doing this initial vetting, within a matter of seconds and minutes, this procedure produces about 50 candidates that are introduced to humans to look at, uh, who make decisions about uh, how to collect more data. Um, and uh, in response to, for example, looking at your host galaxy or any updated gravitational wave estimates, uh, for example, your redshift could be improved. Uh, maybe you have updated sky maps and you take that into account. And, uh, uh, and then you keep making decisions on, you know, uh, which, which events to follow up, uh, such that eventually you end up with a situation where you have a light curve that you see. Uh, and I want to focus on this region a little more carefully. Which, which is what humans do and why, why I think this is an important problem. So uh, when those 50 candidates arrive uh, for humans to look at, and it's, it's in the middle of the night and everyone's awake and uh, not sleeping, uh, they use various communication platforms like Slack or Zoom and they talk. And they talk and they look at events like this. What this is essentially uh, for, for the region, remember there are 50 candidates that are potentially the Kilinova. Maybe none of them are. And uh, so what they're looking at is uh, uh, little cutouts of the region. So this would be sort of the new the new uh, image that was taken. This was the reference image where obviously the event was not there. And you have started building a light curve where you're just seeing a couple of data points. It's just barely happening. Remember, at, in the best case, you actually just have like a few data points along the light curve. So you're, you're seeing a situation like this where you actually, you know, you, you have uh, the light curve going. And based on this very limited information, you have to make the assessment of how to, which, first of all, you have to make this. So it's very hard to say which one the real event is. Okay. So what you really want to be able to do is you want to follow up one of one or some of them in a very specific way so that you get, gain more information. So, you know, how can you get more light curve data points so you can actually identify which the real Kilonova counterpart is? Uh, knowing that the true event probability is about 5% or lesser, lesser in the sense none of them can actually be the real one because maybe it's not even detectable. But at the same time, when you have actually made the allocation, you have actually, you have actually followed up, uh, you may at the same time want to improve constraints on some physical quantity. 
so for example, the slide curve as it comes through, you will eventually use a like a, a Kilanova model to constrain some physics. So if you're actually making the invest uh, investment to better characterize it, you may want that investment to also be useful to constrain your physics. And uh, the problem is that uh, we so far in the past observing runs, we've actually only been able to si solidly identify one kilonova. Uh, but uh, by March next year, when LIGO starts operating, it will double its sensitivity. Uh, so you will, we will receive individually 50 to 250 detections per year compared to 20 last time so the last time LIGO was operating 20 individual notifications were, were spent and 20 individual times people woke up in the middle of the night and they did this this time they could do it maybe up 250 times so this is just exhausting it's not something that scales really well and then uh, by December, which uh, of uh, of next year, you will actually have the behemoth, which is Rubin, that will come online and will start producing ten times as many candidates that as you are seeing from ZTF. Uh, so you have a situation where you probably will be ending up dealing with many more of these instead of fifty that you're probably looking at, and you have to make the decision of which ones to follow up. This is just re so it's a high value target. Uh, which people are just overwhelmed by as to how to actually find them. Um, and at the same time, your follow-up resources, your, you know, sort of like uh, your spectroscopic resources or any other thing that you want to value add with will not scale at nearly the same rate. So the procedures, this entire procedure that I was discussing is not sustainable as you move to LIGO 04 and beyond. So uh, how would a machine sort of solve this problem. And uh, I've actually alluded to this earlier in the in the work when we actually think about making optimal decisions. So in active learning, you want to be very careful about which ones to choose to actually improve your classifier. Uh, but in the most generalized setting, this reinforcement learning setting, you want to be able to make uh, very good decisions and optimal series of decisions so that you optimize your science goal. So classically, this field is optimal experiment design, and it was pioneered by Christine Smith back in the early 1900s. Uh, doesn't has not received the kind of recognition she deserves, uh, which is very unfortunate. Um, in the contemporary machine learning, this uh, is often called. Uh, uh, this is often relabeled as reinforcement learning or optimal sense uh, or optimized sensing. Um, and if you think about what how machine learning will progress, so you you will actually find that supervised learning, uh, which is where we are right now, uh, is the one that takes off the fastest, and you'll actually see most applications that way. But in the most generalized AI that you want to see, which sort of mimics humans' decisions making, which is you know sort of considering all sorts of actions that it could possibly take and arrive at good consequences, um, uh, that would be reinforcement learning, and that's sort of the projected. Uh, uh, avenue where you should see the largest amount of growth in the future. So you you would want to invoke something like this if, uh, for solving the problem. So how would you uh, let a machine do this instead of making graduate students and postdocs stay up all night? So here's what the machine will do. Uh, it will receive, uh, like uh, for example, in the current setting, the exact same 50 targets, and you're going to give it a goal. You're going to say, hey, here's a bunch of resources uh, you have to choose which 50 ones to allocate it to. And your goal is to, one, identify which one the right kilonova is. And you also want to make sure that the allocation that you made eventually would be useful for maximizing constraints on the physics. And the way the machine could do it is as follows. Uh, so here's, and, you know, I'm replacing this with a cartoon so that it's easier to follow along. So remember, you actually get very little information to make that decision on. And the, the bot, uh, the agent in this case, finds itself at this moment in time. Uh, and what it'll do is it'll consider the following. Excuse me. Um, it'll, it'll consider exactly quanti quantifiably what actions it can take. And in this case, for example, it's considering whether uh, you want to add data in uh, green or red, in green or red, or do nothing. So this, this quantification of the action space is very important. And in this case, we are not actually looking to allocate between events. You're actually just making the allocation along an event. So this is a this is a version of the same event where you actually switch the axis. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. But in this case, what happens is that you, you have a fixed budget to work with. Like, say, for example, you can drop five data points 
but you can drop it along a light curve instead of sort of saying I have five data points to allocate between events. Um, and uh, you may want to do this in, in the most uh, uh, in the most generalized settings uh, where you actually have continuous actions. So uh, in this case, you're actually just choosing between uh, you know adding data in G or GNR or do nothing. But you may want to consider integration time. So for example, collect data in G for 30 seconds uh, and in R for 60 seconds, and sort of you know that sophistication can come in. So when you're driving uh, an autonomous car, when the agent is driving an autom autonomous car, it could be how much you want to put the accelerator, uh, you want to press on the accelerator, not whether or not you want to accelerate or not accelerate. Um, and then you may want to impose some budgetary con uh, constraints uh, uh, and some observing cost. Um, in step two, when you are actually considering these actions, you may want to const uh, you may want to estimate how what your outcomes might be if you took that action. So say, for example, here the agent is considering to take action in red, which means collect data in red. It will look at what are the possible outcomes. So when you do this, when you take the data, when you collect data in red, what is the distribution of outcome states that you get? And you can do this uh, using a model. Say, for example, you have a forecasting model that can actually tell you how the light curve will behave in a probabilistic way. You can actually take the distribution of outcomes given that action. And for all the actions and the associated outcomes, you need to estimate the utility of your outcome state. So uh, once you actually get those outcomes, you want to say how useful the outcome states are to improve your objective. So if the goal was to identify an event, you want to say how good is that outcome state to improve your classification accuracy, uh, to improve, for example, your true positive rate, whatever is the interesting quantity that you're interested in, you want to say how much am I improving on that? Um, or for example, for the second case, you may want to think about improving your physics model, or you may want to do all of the above, but the, the utility function, which essentially tells you what your objective is, should be weighed. Uh, the fourth step is really easy. Uh, once you've ascertained which action corresponds to you, you have uh, you have ascertained which uh, what the outcomes will be for the set of actions. Just pick the one which will give you the best outcome. That's it. Uh, and this is a greedy policy. In in reality, in reinforcement learning, you want to do much more sophisticated. But this is a toy example. And step five, you go to the next time step. Uh, you have assimilated the information that you got last time. Maybe it was a good decision, maybe it was not a good decision, but you roll with it and you repeat it on the next time window. You and and you will finish this process either when the episode ends, which means that there's no more light curve to see, or if you just no longer have any any budget to spend. Uh, so we actually did this procedure recently in a paper where we tried to do the following, where you, you saw a type 1A supernova in this case, and you had a fixed budget to allocate to actually get more data points along the light curve, so you maximize your science constraint. In this case, we were after cosmology, which meant that we wanted to add data points so that we could best standardize the light curves. Um, so what this was, so here is, uh, is, a, is a set of light curves that you're seeing. And uh, the the one in the faint points is the ZTF public light curve that the survey was collecting, and the the extra data points and triangles here was what the agent was saying to actually do to better constrain your cosmology model, and uh, uh, and off the bat you can actually notice that it was not done randomly. It was actually uh, you could actually make sense of what was going on. And there were two things that the agent was trying to do in essence. And uh, number one was it, it was trying to fill up gaps. So if for some reason the survey was actually having a large gap in the time series, it would try to fill up those regions. Or, and, uh, or it would try to for target regions that usually had high diversity amongst uh, type 1A supernovae. So you around peaks and around second peaks and values, so type 1A supernovae exhibit second peaks in some of the redder filters. Those were targeted for uh, for extra observations, so you can actually constrain your models best because the models, you know, uh, take into account the underlying distribution. And so when we did that, we actually so these uh, numbers are not relevant. Uh, these were just uh, cosmological parameters that we not cosmological parameters, but for proxy for cosmological parameters we were after. And what we found was that uh, when we took the same budget and we allocated it randomly. 
versus when we use the smart situation where we actually were doing this assessment, we did between two and six times, uh, two and six percentage points better over using uh, your budget in, in a naive fashion. And uh, this was actually kind of impactful because um, if you think about it, uh, you can actually, uh, uh, you, when we were looking at some of these faint events, so we had actually some faint type 1A supernovae, which actually had poorer sampling. We did two to five percentage points better. So we could actually, we, we saw improvements of up to 11 to 12% on some of these parameters for faint supernovae because of this gap filling property. So we actually saw, we, we, we used, uh, we in our paper alluded that such technique could be useful for Rubin, which is uh, this behemoth of a telescope, uh, which looks very faint, uh, which has a high sensitivity, but the light curve is poorly sampled. So uh, in, a, in a poorly sampled light curve situation, you may actually do better. So this, uh, this approach could be useful for that. Um, with that being said, we want eventually with LIGO 04 to enter a regime where we are doing science with statistics and science with large samples, but there's a lot of things that are holding us back from getting there because it's, it's a difficult thing to do. So we, we may need to use multiple machine learning approaches to address this. I have talked about one, which deals with resource allocation and, and sort of being uh, allocating your resources uh, best uh, such that you actually get at your science goal. But there, that's not the only one. Uh, and I have listed a few things here. I, I think Michael can probably add to this much better than I can. Um, but there's, there's a lot of ways in which uh, you can actually do better for multi-messenger science uh, by using machine learning. So I think I will I will just wrap up here. I don't really have anything much to go go from. I'm happy to take questions at this point.